Hey, it's me, Moser, and this is a very quick run through Evo 2.1, Chemical Evidence for Evolution. This is the level two recitation. So we're gonna start with this, and this came directly from the video that you watched on level two. Um, we're given a short section of a DNA sequence, just six bases, for three different species. Species one is obviously the ancestral species. It's got no mutations. Species two and three, both have a change in base 4, a mutation, where a C was formerly, there's now an A. And we can show this on a cladogram, you can see right there. Um, this is very much like the structural cladograms we used, and you can look at this and say, oh, well species 1 should have no mutations, and sure enough, species 1 shows up on the cladogram before that mutation in base 5. Species 2 and 3 should each have a single mutation, and sure enough, they show up on this cladogram after the point where we see the mutation in base 4. Now, based on this little tiny chunk of DNA that we've got, we can't see a difference between species 2 and 3. Obviously, there must be differences between them or we wouldn't be calling them two different species. Okay, let's make it more complicated. I mean, interesting. Okay, so now I've got, I've added another species and I also did something different with species three. Species three now has two mutations. So species one still has no mutations. Species two has two mutations. And species three has got two mutations. So does species four. You can see that in three and four, that last base, base six, has changed from G to T. Okay, again, all the tricks that we used with structural cladograms still work here. Hmm, how many mutations does species three have? Two, therefore it should be sitting above um, or to the right of at least two mutations on this cladogram. But what if we had another species? You knew I couldn't keep it simple. So species five has got a third mutation present, and that is a first, a change in that first base. It's gone from a G to a C. Can we show that on this same cladogram? Of course we can. We would extend the line and put species five out there. So right now, as it stands, this cladogram is telling us that species three, four, and five all have only two mutations. So we need to add something. Where do we need to put it? Go ahead, you can pause this. We need to add it right there, right after species four and before species five. And we're gonna note that there's a mutation in base one where the G turns into a C. Awesome. Now the question is, can we take this information and put it on a cladogram that looks more, hmm, like this? Of course we can. Of course, the first thing we wanna look for is a species that has no mutations. And as we established before, that'd be species one. Hey, we're done with species one. That's all we have to do. No changes to their DNA. So which species has a single mutation? Well, that would be species two. Species two has a base four change from a C to an A. And that's the only mutation species two has. So the line for species two is only gonna go through that box. Great. Well, everybody else has that mutation too, but they have other mutations. So species three and four also have a mutation in base six. It went from a G to a T. Now that's the last mutation they have, so we can go ahead and just show them. But species five has to be difficult. Species five has one more mutation. So we write in the base one change from G to C and put species five there. Again, this is very, and this is very much like the PBS Nova game. We can actually count how many boxes a species line travels through one, two, three. That means that species has got three mutations. Awesome. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this. This is from your worksheet and you were given four species and a little segment of each of their DNA. And the first question you were asked was how to break this into two separate groups. You know, I've highlighted here, I think it's base nine. Two of them have an A, two of them have a C. And somebody asked earlier, um, well, how do you know that A was the ancestral DNA. How do you know that species V and W have the original DNA and that it wasn't originally a C? Well, in this case, you kind of, this is a cheat almost, you know because I told you. But if you didn't know, could you still put them on a cladogram? Of course you could. So 
instead of having, you know, an unchanged, you would just note that there's an A at 9 in one lineage and a C at 9 in the other. And then we could just go ahead and document what was in position 7 and 4 in each of them, and we'd be done. Cool beans. So now I want to review some stuff from the quizzes that you started level 2 with. Hey, meet our friend the fruit fly. It's a cute little thing, isn't it? Um, what percentage of DNA did we have in common with fruit flies? Do you remember? Are you thinking maybe 60%? If you are, you'd be right. So you and a fruit fly share 60% of your genes. What do you have in common with a fruit fly? Well, they have cells. They have bilateral symmetry. They have muscles. Um, they use oxygenated blood to power chemical processes like cellular respiration in those cells. Actually, I guess we have quite a bit in common with them. But there's a lot we don't have in common with them. So, you know, 60% of the genes. Now, let's talk about something cuter, huh? Oh, look at how adorable it is. Yeah, it transmits several diseases too. But what percentage of DNA do you remember from the quizzes do you have in common with a mouse? Were you thinking more than 60? Were you thinking 90? Good. So you and a white-footed mouse share about 90% of your genes. Now, mice are mammals. You and a mouse both have bilateral symmetry. You both have eyes that are remarkably similar in structure. You both have four limbs. You both have a spine. You both um, are from a species that gives live birth and nurses their young. You both have fur for Pete's sakes. And the structure of their heart and the structure of our heart isn't all that different. Theirs is just a whole lot smaller. So in other words, you got a lot in common with a little mouse. Now for the big one. Oh, it's a three generation portrait. Um, this is, of course, the chimpanzee. Do you remember what percentage of genes we share with chimps? 99. Hmm, it's a lot in common. And again, all the things we shared with the mouse, the vertebrae and the um, hair, the live birth, the nursing, the young, the, the general mammal characteristics, the heart, the eyes, all that stuff, four limbs. In addition, chimps have opposable thumbs and cool beans. They have them not only on their hands, but on their feet. Um, chimps have a lot of cellular processes that go on that are the same as ours. Their hemoglobin is identical to ours. Lots of similarities. Okay, great. But I want to flash back to something that we said earlier in the year and see if this is confusing anybody or troubling anybody. You remember this? We talked about gel electrophoresis. And we said that siblings shared 50% of their DNA on an electrophoresis gel. Wait a minute. Are you saying that I share more DNA with a chimp than with my sister? No, but it could sound that way. So let's talk about what this really means. This is a picture of some of the most unalike humans I could find. These are some South African tribesmen and some tall European guy. How much DNA do you think they have in common? Well, 99.9% .9 of it. Yeah. 99.9% .9 of all of their DNA is identical. That means that a 0.1% difference in DNA gives us all the differences we see. That's pretty remarkable. So let's go back to that question of siblings. All these pairs, all these sets of siblings, I shouldn't say pairs, all these sets of siblings obviously share more DNA than these completely unrelated individuals. Well, yeah, they do. While all humans share 99.0% of their DNA, siblings share 99.95. In other words, when they, we say they share 50%, they share 50% of the 0.1% that makes us different. So clearly, they share more than you do with a chimp. Okay, now let's talk briefly about the other chemical evidence for evolution. Things like hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that's used in every single vertebrate and quite a few invertebrates. And we can look at the amino acid sequence and see that they're almost identical in humans and gorillas. I think they are identical in humans and chimps because they're our closest living relative. Well, great, but why would we look at proteins instead of just looking at the DNA? It's a good question. This is also from your worksheet. So here I've got three species and an uh, um, amino acid sequence and some random samples of DNA sequences. Now, if you recall from when we did protein synthesis, 
not all changes in DNA make a change in the amino acid. There are a lot of amino acids that are coded for by two, three, or even four different codons. So sometimes you can change two or three letters and still have the same amino acid. Oh, that means that by the time you've got a couple of species that have two or three amino acids that are different in a uh, protein, there may have been six or seven changes to the underlying DNA. So that's one reason. It's, it's sort of a shortcut to looking for big change. The other reason is honestly kind of it's easier. Imagine that you have been asked to see if two individuals copied something identically. You've been given a choice. You can see it as just let you know the words with punctuation and spacing or all the letters smashed together no punctuation no spacing which one do you think will be easier to check well the words obviously because we're looking at bigger chunks at a time it's kind of the same thing that biologists are doing when they look at amino acid sequences instead of straight up strands of dna so now let's talk about this lovely little thing Ooh, ooh, what is it what is it what is it it's one of our vocabulary terms. <laughs> it's DNA wrapped around a bunch of proteins. Do you have it yet? It's, it's a chromosome. And a chromosome is a single piece like this. People get confused because in middle school, when you learn cell reproduction, you see it like this. That's after it's copied itself and you've got two pieces there. But really, they look like that most of the time. Just a stick of DNA. Okay. And these sticks of DNA are kind of cool. They've got little structures in the middle where they can tie themselves together. But what I want to talk about is these little end caps. They're called telomeres. And telomeres function kind of like, well, these things on the end of shoelaces. I don't know what they're called. The thing on the end of the shoelace keeps the shoelace from unraveling. And guess what? The telomere kind of does the same thing for the chromosome. So it kind of caps it off and shows where the end is. Okay, cool. Let's talk about shoelaces. So what if I had just, you know, regular little short study sneaker shoelaces, but I had these really cool boots. I need longer laces, but you know, in my rush to get out the door, all I've got are short laces. So hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tie the darn things together. It'll work. It'll get me through the day. I'll get better laces later. There's a problem though. What do you see in the middle of that shoelace? Oh, yeah. You can actually see those little end pieces that were supposed to keep the shoelace from unraveling. Um, and it's okay. Like I said, who cares? Well, funny, we should talk about that. We're going to come back to shoelaces. Let's talk about wolves and coyotes. So, you remember, wolf, western coyote, can make babies. Their babies can also make babies. Why? They have the same number of chromosomes. How convenient. 39 pairs, 78 individual chromosomes. Cool beans. Babies who make babies. It's good stuff. Now, if you remember, we also talked about horses and donkeys. And horses and donkeys can make babies, but their babies, the mules of the world, cannot make babies. Why? Well, because horses and donkeys have different numbers of chromosomes. Donkeys have 31 pairs. Horses have 32 pairs. Huh. Where is this all going, Moser? So here are the chromosomes for two species that I totally made up. These are closely related species, we'll assume. And one species has got four pairs. One has got five pairs. And I want to see if you notice anything odd about any of the chromosomes. Maybe anything strange? over here? Hmm? What? What? Oh! That! Yeah, it almost looks like those have a telomere in the middle. That's weird. Well, as a matter of fact, they do. So, in sometimes when um, cells are being reproduced, you'll have a situation where a chromosome actually gets stuck on top of another chromosome. And then they start traveling as one thing. And the clue is when you, that, that does a couple things. One, it reduces the numbers of pairs of chromosomes for that species. Hmm. Now instead of five pairs, they have four pairs. 
Oh, I see. And when you look at that species that's got four pairs, but is closely related to the five pair species, their longest chromosome has telomere material in the middle. Oh, it does. How cool. Well, actually, if you look at the donkey chromosome, where they only have 31 pairs, you'll find a chromosome that's got a telomere in the middle. At some point in their evolutionary history, there was that chromosomal fusion. And so we see these, these little chromosomes get stuck together and start to travel as one. If you look at the human genome, you'll find the same thing. Chimps, our closest relatives, have one more pair of chromosomes than us. And one of our chromosomes actually has a fused area where you can see a telomere. Okay, you got the level two material? Excellent. Watch the video, take some notes. I'd rather do this live and in person with you, but if we can't, at least you have this. Have a good day. See you later.